so the first uh, question I want to ask you is, uh, how did you go from a historian of science in the 20th century to deciding you're going to write about the founding of the United States? It comes from a couple stores, because as you, I guess at least three. One, of course, is I am a law professor, too, with yeah. a law degree, and always was a law professor. From the very beginning, I had a joint appointment with the University of Georgia. So the Constitution has a lot to do with constitutional law and a lot to mm. do with law. So I always already had a, I was teaching courses in that. I was working in what does the Constitution mean. I became a law professor just as originalism was gaining strength. Mm. And so you needed to work in original opinion, original ideas. And since I was a PhD in history, at least any sort of history, um, I could do that. So I had that covered. And that was part of it. A and you did a little book on Madison's Constitution, or notes, well, Madison's notes? Well, that comes from the second one. That's the second reason. The okay. second reason is, at Georgia, we always, because we live and die on the big Everyone in every student at Georgia is required to take a, basically two, back then two quarters of American history, and they take the first half and the second half of American history. And so no matter whether we were a historian of Africa or a historian of science, such as myself, or a historian of whatever, we also had to take the survey course of American history to get the, um, to cover all the vast right. yeah. students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the classes would be huge. Uh, Huge, huge. Huge, 300. Uh, there was one hall that was 450. Wow. And so I always chose the first half of American history for a very practical reason. I figured if I'm teaching the second half, I'm going to have to constantly add a new lecture at the end, and yeah. I'll have to always be yeah. trimming the earlier ones. Confirming the lazy professor stereotype. <laughs> so Thank you for I that. I nailed um, United States till uh, 1865. I'd never have to change my lecture. And <laughs> so the result is I covered the first half of American history. But I wasn't trained as a American historian. I was trained as a historian of science. Of course, I do a lot, quite a few American science papers. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I drew on my legal background to really focus that first part of the course, what I knew. Mm -hmm. And what I knew was the Constitutional Convention. I knew Franklin. I knew Washington. I knew Madison. I knew those people. So I sort of privileged that period of American history. So I was mm. already doing that. And then the final one, essentially, and this will bring you back um, ultimately to your question you were going to ask about the Scopes book. I had written that Scopes book, and it was a bestseller, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm. And so I was asked um, at one point, I was, I'd written two other books, uh, written, mm -hmm. uh, contacted by a um, publisher, and said, can you write another book like the Scopes book? Um, for it. You've done some <laughs> other things. Can you write a book like the Scopes book? And I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, you're saying one thing. Yeah, write a good book is yeah. what he said. Write another good <laughs> book. What do you mean by a book in the Scopes style? <laughs> oh, because of course you could have meant a lot of things. And he says, well, I love the book. And what I read in it was you took one small episode mm. in American history and you unpacked a whole generation through one small two-week episode, mm. the way you pulled things together. And it involved the issue of science versus religion, and people love that conflict of science versus religion. Can you do another book in American history on a small, discrete episode that unpacks science and religion? Mm. And I said, well, I can, I guess. After that book came out, I taught a seminar, graduate student seminar, in episodes in science and religion in American history. There you go. Yeah. And I can send you the syllabus. And I had eight of them that we unpacked. And he, one of them was the election of 1800, mm. where Jefferson was viewed as the candidate of science, and Adams was viewed publicly as the candidate of religion. Mm. There's not, there's, that's, not, that's not actually true, as my book points out, but that was the perception. Just like the Scopes trial wasn't actually like Inherit the Wind. Mm. Um, and, uh, <laughs> So very good I movie was, and I play. Was very good movie, but not very good history. Well, so that's not new. I and the, <coughs> knew that no one had ever written a book about the election of 1800 that was a blow by blow description. Mm. My model was Teddy White's uh, making of a president in 1960, 
there were great books about the election of the 1800s, Cunningham, for example. Yeah, yeah. But they're broad, cosmic things. Yeah, Cunningham the starts the in 1794. And I mean, he never yeah. really gets to the right. war. He never <laughs> yeah. really gets to the election of 1800. Yeah. <laughs> or if it is, it's just yeah. only in a passage at the end. Yeah. Oh, this is where it all led to. And so I did a blow-by-blow -blow description where you focus just on that event. But I use that. Every chapter is, covers two months. It's exactly the approach that Teddy White used. And, but then I take each chapter and it turns inside out and you get a whole view. Hmm. And so that's how I end up writing that because he wanted, a book. of all the ones, episodes oh. of science and religion that went out, but that's the one that stuck out. And so I wrote that book. And when I'd written that book, and I'd already written a, what started as there was no, my students in my big survey class, there was no readable version of Madison's notes on the Constitution. Right. You had the Koran, yeah. but you know it's a mess if you don't understand parliamentary procedure. And I had been the parliamentarian for the Washington State House of Representatives, so I knew how parliamentary procedures worked. Hmm. And so I then decided to turn Koran into a readable short text about this size. It's a little bigger than this, and it was brought out by the Modern Library, you know that series mm -hmm. that uh, the Modern Library has? Mm -hmm. And it's been a very popular book with them. And it just takes the Madison's notes and makes them readable. Mm. And it reads sort of like a Shakespeare play. You get everybody going back and forth. And so I've been through the Constitution. You have to go through the Constitution. And I prepared that first for my students at Georgia. And then it, people liked it so much that I ended up publishing it with another person at Georgia. And the result was, you really have to go through those notes closely to turn it into a, a short one volume set. Mm. So I had the Constitution sort of down. And the convention, yeah. And then I had the election of 1800 down. Mm. And so that led to the Washington book. So that's how I yeah. stepped back okay. with some, some rational explanation of how I ended up writing. Well, it, that makes sense. Well, we're going to get back to that and get into George Washington, who's the most important person in American history. But uh, before we do that, uh, no argument for the, me. The, uh, it's not, um, that's not popular these days to say those kinds of things. Um, but the, uh, the election of 1800 book, very popular. Uh, I think uh, Karl Rove was seen with a copy under his arm well, at Carl, some point. Karl Rove. It, Maybe it, you photoshopped that Bush, in a picture got Bush to, to, to read it, and that led to Bush sending me a note and then having me to the White House. But Karl Rove was later asked by the Wall Street Journal, and this is sort of fun. If you, remember, if you know, Wall Street Journal every Friday, I think it is, asked somebody to list the five greatest books ever written on some topic that they know about. So they asked Karl Rove to write the five best books ever written about a campaign. And I came in second behind... Teddy White, right? And I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't begrudge him that choice. That's good. That's great. Now, so quickly though, on the um, on the Scopes book, yeah. one of the things one of the reviewers wrote about it was that you, uh, well, and you write this in the book itself. I mean that that it's a it's the opening of the sort of cultural war uh, in a way, um, but it's also kind of an age old problem in American uh, ideas about. Individual liberty versus mass democracy. Right. What do you what do you mean by that? How did it manifest itself in that trial in that way? Well, at the time, William Jennings Bryan was one of the most famous people in America, uh, and he was the personification of popular rule. He believed that the trusts and the powers that be were controlling everything, and we need democracy wherever it leads us and that the people can never be wrong. They can be a little misguided in the long run. He was like Frank Norris, yeah. um, who would be a Republican parallel, that, and hence they brought us things like initiative referendum, right. and recall, yeah. all yeah. sorts of things. All those popular uh, all things those you popular see in California, right. initi ballot initiatives and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And the single house legislature in Nebraska. And so you, Brian believed that with the depth of his heart. And if you go back then, if you go back to that time period, he grew up, he came of age, he was nominated for president three times, before the First World War. And I think, I honestly think the most profound event of the 20th century was the First World War. I think it changed the entire world and changed us. And 
Before that, most of the world was ruled by monarchs. The Kaiser really ruled in Germany. The um, Austria-Hungary Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, the Chinese Empire. Most of the world was run by monarchs. And even in England, you had a very limited, it was before the uh, extension of the franchise, you had a very limited, where you could believe that what was critical for freedom, what was critical for liberty, was popular rule. And that's what uh, people like uh, Brian believed to that depth of their heart. During the First World War, and the Scope Trial was shortly after it, when you saw the First World War and when you saw what Woodrow Wilson did and the Palmer, Attorney General Palmer did in the name of democracy, we went to war and then running roughshod over any notions of individual rights and individual liberties. People thrown in jail, people without any sort of, uh, of trust. Americans, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Alien Act, sending it people, mm -hmm. yeah. citizens back to Russia or some place like that. Um, and there was this, and the, the forced limitations on free speech, you couldn't speak against the war. And of course, much of the, many of the people were against the war. You couldn't speak about, um, you couldn't do anything to disrupt the draft. People were thrown in jail. And that taught many Americans, wait a minute. What is essential to America is not democracy. What's essential to America is individual liberty. Mm -hmm. Now, that echoes back. That echoes in my story, yeah. Return of George Washington. Yeah. Because That's Patrick Henry believed all that mattered was democracy where people like Madison and Jefferson believe, no, we fought for liberty, individual liberty, and we need to protect individual liberty. We like democracy, but what's really important is individual liberty. That sort of battle, that sort of tension, yeah. it came about then again. And the Scopes trial was caught in that because William Jennings Bryan, for all his progressive political views, uh, was uh, co very conservative religiously. And he thought that teaching evolution led people to accept militarism, survival of the fittest. He thought Germany was motivated by a Darwinian thought. He thought Carnegie and Rockefeller both said they were motivated by Darwinian thought, or really they were thinking more Spencer. But Spencer and Darwin were combined in people's minds. Mm. And so the oppression of labor, the survival of the fittest, eugenics, a whole bunch of things were connected. So Brian thought we shouldn't, it shouldn't be taught as true in public schools or it shouldn't be taught at all. It depends on when you were catching them yeah. talking. And he thought if the people chose to pass a law limiting the te teaching of a scientific theory, that's a good thing. Mm. And we should defend that's democracy. Now, the, the forces that had come into being during the First World War, you had many previous liberals who were right in line with Brian, loved Brian, they loved Morris. They changed. There was a, gr a younger group. They founded, for example, the ACLU, but it wasn't just the ACLU. It was Charles Evan Hughes felt this way about it too. He was a progressive yeah. Republican, uh, and he, many people said, "Wait, we have to worry. We have to. Our concern is freedom, and if we prevent a school teacher, if we outlaw a school teacher teaching about a scientific theory, that is, that who knows where it could lead, and we need to protect freedom of speech. And this is when." The freedom of speech had never been protected under the Constitution before. Um, you have decisions before, and as long as you pass the law, that's fine. We get, in the same year, we get the Gitlaw case c coming down in 1925, where the Supreme Court for the first time announced there is something you can violate with freedom of speech. Yeah. So that's the tension that is playing out right at Scopes, that the opponents are saying, this limits the freedom of a public school teacher to teach a valid scientific theory. Where Brian is defending it, no, this is the freedom of the people to decide what is taught in public schools. Mm -hmm. And that's the tension that plays out in the real life. It's yeah. not the tension you see in Inherit the Wind at all, because yeah. that's not the purpose of Inherit the Wind. And so <laughs> that's the story I get to tell in that one and it makes it a, a really a gripping story and yeah. really a very American story that we yeah. have to relive 
every day, today, well, tomorrow. Yeah, I, I think, the, the, and the reason I brought it up about the, because you do that so elegantly, because that connects exactly with the founding era, but it also connects with the present. I mean, that conflict between majority will, democracy, which we, we all believe in as a thing, and individual liberty, you know, the boundaries of it are defined politically and they're defined in, in courtrooms and, and, it's, and it's messy, you know, and there's injustices in the, in the margins all the time. But I also think that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you rightly point out, you know, if you say, well, that's the first time freedom of speech is sort of established, and it's, it's, a, it's a certainly the first time at a national level that you're getting it in the way that, you know, you're getting the Supreme Court acting in a way that we've come to think that they have always acted, which is, you know, they define sort of the meaning of these rights in the Constitution, and then people fight over who should be on the Supreme Court. And if the, if the Scopes trial had gone to the United States Supreme Court, as everyone thought it would, that's how it was, yeah. the case was designed, Charles Evan Hughes, which had been the Republican candidate for governor, for president, nominee for president in, in 1916, right. he had been on the Supreme Court, he had left to run, be the nominee for president, he was then president of the ADA, and he would soon go back on the court as Hoover's appointment to be chief justice, he had agreed to argue for Scopes against the law in the Supreme Court. So we're not talking about some radical leftist versus, yeah. we're talking about a fundamental battle that people, because of what happened in World War I, people now realized and now had to think, well, what do we really care about? And if you really want me to make it contemporary, my one, <laughs> I don't want to make it too political, but the one time that I really I didn't think, it was before he read my book, but where I wouldn't have thought that Carl uh, Rove, President you're Bush, about, oh, Bush quite got my point <laughs> was when he said, we are going into Iraq for democracy. We want democracy there. And I said, no, no, we want human rights there. If you're going for any reason, you're going for human rights. You're going to protect liberty. You don't want democracy. You're going to get, well, you see what we get with democracy. Mm -hmm. So right. you do <laughs> need to worry about both of those, and that's why I'm saying yeah. that today, because it's still relevant in many parts of the world. Um, what do we really value? And I think, I truly believe, from reading all their papers, that George Washington did not go to war for democracy. No. He went to war for individual freedom and protect and with yeah. and protection of private property, which is part of individual freedom. Right, and they, the founders, they believed in popular government in the service of the protection of liberty, that that was one tool in the toolbox that you can deploy uh, in a constitutional scheme that will help assure liberty. Well, because they but it's not the end goal. The end goal isn't, let's get everybody no. voting. You know? But because they thought that if you had a monarchy, yeah. it would ultimately, inevitably lead to tyranny. Mm -hmm. So the democracy was more a means in the end. In Absolutely mind. right, exactly. So, uh, all right. So let's get back then. So you you wrote the book on the election of eighteen hundred, which doesn't interest us since Washington is already dead when that happens. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you realize that you, you wrote a book about the founding, but you you didn't have the main guy in it. So you're like, uh, okay, I'm going to write a book on Washington. Right. Yeah. No, really. Yes. No, why, no, but why did Washington? Of to that. Yeah. So you're sort of like, well, of truth. Yeah. well, I this chapter had come out and it was popular. And it was widely read and it was a, it was a question. And I said. Well, this is telling a, a key element. Yeah. This is telling the story of how we ended up with a partisan government. Mm. Before that, we didn't really have the vision of a partisan government, but 1800 and then the 12th Amendment mm -hmm. um, yeah. institutionalized partisan government. Yeah. But I needed to go back. If I wanted to tell take, take the it, whole take story, it a step further. Remind remind everybody why the Twelfth Amendment institutionalizes right. a sense of, of two parties. The the Twelfth Amendment. I know everybody's like, oh yeah, that's my favorite amendment. Oh, it's uh, a very important one. Uh, the uh, quickest past yeah. one. Uh, before it's the last amendment to the Constitution before the Civil War. Right. Think about that. And it's done in 1804. And it's so the, there's this huge stretch between 1804 and the Civil War that they're not touching the Constitution. And it's the most rapidly so. passed amendment ever, most quickly ratified. Uh, so what is it? Before that, when the framers were sitting around in Philadelphia, they really didn't have an idea of partisan government. They knew there were some states where there was true partisanship. Pennsylvania, New York had already established two-party systems. 
but they also had the vision that you'd see in South Carolina, say, and somewhat in Virginia at that time, where you would elect in a very competitive races, okay, the best, what you, who you thought was best person and most represent your values, and then those persons would go to the state legislature and they wouldn't form caucuses. They wouldn't form partisan caucuses. There wouldn't be a constant alignment. They would right. shift. They'd be yeah. aligned on some things. They'd be aligned on other things. They'd use their own best judgment. And that was also reflected in the Electoral College idea, the idea of Electoral College. Okay, we're going to let each congressional district pick one and every state pick two, and we hope they'll be elected, but maybe they'll be appointed. We'll let the states decide that. And then they'll all get together in their own states, and they can talk about the different candidates, and they can use their best judgment to negotiate out uh, the leaders and from the, from the second votes of all, because they figured everyone would vote for their own state for the number one, except for Washington, except at the beginning, from the second votes, um, because they couldn't vote two people from their own states, um, a national candidate would emerge, and whoever gets a majority of the votes would become president. And if nobody got a majority, you'd go to the House of Representatives. Now, that requiring a majority is, is important to remember because we are one of the few democracies that have a strictly a two-party system. Most places, such as in Canada or Germany, have multiple parties mm -hmm. and they yeah. come and go. They build coalitions and they Because rule. you don't have a requirement of a majority. Yeah. Since we have a majority, you're pushed to, to try to uh, nominate people who can get more than half. And so it changes to a two party. But what had happened over time was after Washington, even when Washington ran the first two times, even when he ran, while he was universally accepted, there was actually a partisan divide for vice president. First time and very much the second time, where Clinton came very close to Adams the second time. Clinton was further behind the first time, but he was clearly the alternative. By the it's Clintons, they're always running for office. Uh, from New York? <laughs> yeah. From New York? Unbelievable. From New York. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you get to the third, yeah. then you get to the third election, and it's not run as a partisan election, but effectively it yeah. is. Yeah, you have a slate campaign. of candidates. You have Burr and Jefferson. You've and, got and by the last one, by the, by, the, um, by the election of 1800, when Adams has to run again, it is purely partisan. But yeah. the problem was, the problem was that they had originally decided the Electoral College system, that every, every elector had two votes, two equal votes. Because remember, the fear was that once Washington was gone from the scene, that everyone would vote for their own state candidate and we'd have nobody with the majority. So force everybody to cast two votes. And if you force every elector to cast two votes, but only one can be from your state, then from the second vote, a national candidate would be emer would emerge. So that's why they required two. But it's a f by the way, it's a funny scene in the, con in the convention at that point. So Governor Morris, the ultimate Rue Goldberg of the convention, who can think up some <laughs> weird, puckishly think up some weird mechanisms to solve every problem, some weird compromise. And he was very close with George Washington. George Washington thought he was the funniest guy he knew. And they'd go fishing all the free, every free time from the convention, go off fishing. Um, they spent a lot of time together. But he, uh, he came up with the Electoral College, and, uh, or the way, actually the way it worked with the two votes. And, but the problem with that two vote system is it works if your normal system is operating. But if you break down to a hard party vote, firm party vote, because the idea is everybody's running for president. Mm -hmm. And whoever gets the majority will be president, and whoever comes in second becomes vice president. Well, if you get, if you shift to hard party voting, yeah. all your electors are going to vote for the same two people. They're going to vote for the person, to, they're going to have a party ticket, because they don't want a situation where the opponent is vice president, because then you'd have what happened during Adams' term. Yeah. Adams was president, Jefferson was vice president, and he spent the entire four years undermining yeah. Adams intentionally. He was vice president. He was sitting right there. He could follow all the debates. He was yeah. throwing in every curveball he could, and of course, he was collecting all the information, and he was orchestrating the opposition from within. It's so a great incentive for assassination as well.
as happened. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. And so you end up with this situation that says, so they get to the next election, and both parties are now wise to this, and they say, we've all got to have cast all our votes because we don't. They knew it was going to be extremely close. Jefferson had only beat Adams by three electoral votes. Adams had only beat Jefferson by three electoral votes, which meant if two votes had flipped, then Jefferson would have won in 96. And those two votes were easy because one rogue delegate from Virginia and one rogue delegate from North Carolina yeah. had voted for Adams or he wouldn't have won the presidency. Um, as could happen this year with the one rogue from Maine. You know, that one Maine delegate, because they can go 3-1, three three could yeah. flip the election. Um, and it was that close, and they thought it was going to be that close again. And when the electors are casting their ballot back then because there wasn't mass communication, you did not know how the other states had voted. Right. And so they all, lockstep, voted. The, they didn't want Adams to come in second, and they knew he was really close. They knew, it they knew he might have won. In fact, yeah. Adams went to bed thinking he'd won. And so well, you can't just have somebody throw their vote away. Throw the vote, and yeah. so everybody voted for Jefferson and Adams. Uh, Jefferson Burr. and Burr, yeah. not a single one of those people thought they were voting for Burr for president. Burr was the vice presidential candidate. It was clear, but they came up in a tie. Then it went to Congress to decide, and Congress decides with every state. Uh, um, the, each member of the House doesn't vote; they vote as a state. If, if it happens this time, if it ends up within a tie this time, which could happen by, if you took real clear politics Dear God, please. right now. That would be so much and fun. And you flip one state, <laughs> it's a tie right now. And then <laughs> the states vote can't as wait, a state. Can't wait for that. <laughs> and let's see what, the, see what Paul, Paul Ryan does then. Um, each, each state votes as a, as a, as a yeah, unit. As a unit, yeah. And the right. trouble was when they voted, no, neither party had a majority of the states because there were enough that the delegation was exactly split two and two or three and three or one and one that if everybody voted a party line, we'd never get a president. And it went 35 ballots yeah. um, with all the Federalists voting for Burr and all the, well, Virtually all the Federalists voting for Burr, and virtually all the and all the Republicans voting yeah, for basically Jefferson. just to stick it to Jefferson. Just to stick it to Jefferson, and just make this pretty chaotic. And they thought <laughs> Burr might support them because they knew he was. A, right. I mean, they knew he was a totally self-serving, spineless rogue. That's what they'd write, and says, "So he'll be our man. Uh, we we if we take him to the chair, he doesn't." Yeah, have but he'll be our rogue. He'll be our That's rogue. That's the key. Right. Yeah. And he'll disrupt the opposition. So the result was that. The, so they the had to amend does, the Constitution. The amendment yeah. makes makes a key change that the that you cast that every every elector still casts two votes, but one for president and one for vice president. Yeah. Just a bit of humor, if I can throw one big, because it's a funny let's, thing. Let's get some humor in here. I think it's funny. Absolutely. At the Constitutional Convention, because this is the only reason we have a vice presidency. There was no vice presidency ever proposed. There was no thought of having a vice president. And so way at the end, when, when weeks, two weeks before it's all over, um, Governor Morris comes in with this weird electoral college. And he has everybody <laughs> voting for two. And the only reason they're voting for two was because he thought out of the second vote, as I explained, we'll get a president. But then one of the other delegates raises their hand. You can see it right in the face but how will you explain to the people why they're casting two votes? Well, the honest answer is because we won't get a president out of the yeah. first vote, but that doesn't sound right. And so they're sitting there going, well, what can we do? And, says, and somebody else says, I have an idea. Let's have a vice president. And then they think they get two votes because they're voting for a vice president and a president. And it was, that's the only reason we have a vice president to let people understand why electors are casting two votes rather than one. In other words, as Adam said, it's the most meaning. I've been given the most meaningless job that's ever been invented. Or a later one, Nance Gardner has even a more descriptive view of the job. It was ne they never envisioned a vice presidency. It was only yeah. a, a spur of the moment, last minute addition to help people understand why electors cast two votes. 
So, so that's amazing. That's the obligatory conversation about the Electoral College, so we're done with that. Uh, that was great. Yeah. But the amendment, the amendment assume, the, way they, the way they changed it, it assumes that there'll be, there'll be two parties. It, it, it has yeah. to be because they're yeah. voting now. Right. They're now voting for a ticket, a party yeah. ticket of a president and vice president. Right. Okay. And that, that, in, that really finishes the structural creation of our democracy. And it is, we're stuck with it. It's, it's, it's 200 yeah. years later where people think we might be better off with a, with a prime minister system. We don't got it. We got what, what they gave us. We got what we got. All right. So, uh, all right. So let's get back to Washington then. Uh, Who? It's 738. Who? We're getting to George Washington. Who? Um, uh, so uh, the, the Return of George Washington is a fantastic book. Uh, the lectures were drawn out of that work uh, that you gave at the Gay Games uh, lecture series. And this book uh, adds a few things. You have an essay on the Newburgh conspiracy at the very beginning. Which I, was a lecture I gave at Newburgh. Mm. I was invited to give a lecture at Newburgh, yeah. and so I gave that one there. So I like the way you approach the Newburgh conspiracy here. Talk a little bit about what was happening at Newburgh and why it matters so much to understand uh, George Washington, to understand the founding. It tells us volumes about Washington. It's one of the truly great, great moments in Washington, um, in the life of Washington. What we had was Washington at this point, the, the, the battle of, um, uh, the British had been, for all practical purposes, defeated. Uh, we've had the victory at Yorktown. But it took a lot of time to finally convince George III to go along with it, and there's no treaty yet, and England could always change its mind. But once the Battle of Yorktown was won, the state stopped paying their money to Congress. Congress had no money to pay the troops anymore because they couldn't raid funds. And Washington was distraught. Here he had these soldiers who were risking their lives and soldiers who were still in the field in Newburgh outside, because the only British left was a contingent in Savannah, a contingent in Charleston, a contingent in New York, but main contingent in New York. And so Washington has a contingent in Newburgh, which is just north of New York in the, in the Hudson Valley. And these people weren't being paid. They hadn't been paid for a couple of years. And they think, they think there's a conspiracy starting. That, and it's, it appears to be working with Governor Morris this Rue Goldberg fellow, and <laughs> Robert Morris, and possibly Alexander Hamilton, who were all in Philadelphia, who wanted a national government. They were nationalists. They thought we needed a national government mostly for, inter for interstate trade, that we'll never grow as a country if each state's separate. We need a whole national bank they were pushing for, national economy. But they, the national government had to have the power to be able to directly raise money, either directly order the states to pay or order individuals to pay, or at least have a customs duty, get some money and not have to go hat in hand to the states for any money they want, because the states wasn't giving us, weren't giving us any money. And so they thought, and the creditors, are, are the, the wealthy people who had donated money to, the, to, the, our, to our, um, revolution weren't being no, paid they, either. They loaned. Loan yeah. money. Yeah. They loaned yeah. money. They didn't donate. You're right. Yeah. Good correction. And we, they weren't being Mount repaid. Vernon takes donations. The they government takes loans. Not being repaid. Yeah. And so they yeah. wanted the government to raise money to be able to pay them. Yeah. But they also wanted to pay the troops. And Washington wanted his own troops paid. He thought this was, he thought, well, you can think about what he thought, Washington, this was wrong. I mean, this is the deep, deep concern of Washington. And so this conspiracy starts among fostered and promoted somewhat by Robert Morris and Governor, and Governor Morris, certainly involving Horatio Gates uh, and his men, that we will not disband until we're paid, or if we're not paid, we will disband now and the British will come back. And so there's thoughts of literally a military coup d'etat to force the states to give the federal, central government the power to tax. So the, the historians argue about you know, how serious this is in the sense right. of, okay, right. uh, it, w is this a right. real crisis? Is this a, is this a fake bluster? Right. I mean, where do you come down on that? I mean, it may be different. Governor Morris may have a different thing in mind than Horatio Gates has in mind. I mean, it's right. not clear. But where do Correct. you come down? I mean, is there, is there a real cabal around Gates 
at Newburgh amongst these officers and his, their supporters, you know, to, to basically, you know, hold onto their arms, threaten Congress until they get what they want? I think there was a little of both. If you can read the letters of Hamilton and of Morris, and they are very careful with what they write. And you could, in, and they're smart men. You could interpret it both ways. Mm -hmm. You could have interpreted it as a bluff simply to force the states to do something but no intention of it really happened. Or you could interpret it as this is real. Yeah. We really do want it. Because there is a history of Hamilton earlier urging Je Washington to just become a king. There is some background of that. And so you can read it that, OK, Washington, you're going to become, we need a king. There were people who thought we need a king, a more Republican king, but somewhat of a king. And you see some of that in Hamilton. Um, and so you can't quite tell where he stands. I do think that some of Gates' officers really believed it, and they were ready to do it, Sullivan and a few others. Yeah, yeah. But I also Armstrong. think some of the others weren't willing to go that far, but were using it as a bluff. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't know which it was and you wouldn't have a way to know it. And so what they did is they call a meeting where they're going to say either Washington's going to be with us or we're going to go to Horatio Gates or some other leaders. We're going to have an over, uh, uh, uprising. And you see some of that actually happen a little later in Philadelphia where, where they do attack. Some of the troops there do attack um, the, the, the state house where the, uh, the government was meeting. And they have to flee and they have to move to, yeah, to, um, yeah. to um to New Jersey, so they move over to Princeton. Um, so there is a mutiny. So there's, there's a real possibility. I do not think it ever could have succeeded in America. I think it would have failed, but there was a danger that it could. And so what happens is Washington, and I do believe he prepared it beautifully, he canceled the meeting that was being called illegally, but then he authorized a later meeting and clearly said, it's going to be run by Horatio Gates. So the conspirators thought, oh, Washington's not going to be there. He is giving us tacit approval to let us go forward. It's clear they thought he was giving them tacit approval. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens is that on the moment when the meeting, and it's in this lovely hall that they've rebuilt, uh, the temple, and three, they've rebuilt it perfectly. Um, up at Newburgh, yeah, up you, at there's Newburgh. a reconstruction so of it. so wonderful. The Temple of Virtue. The Temple of Virtue, which had been built where the meeting was, and all the officers were there. And at the key moment when they think Horatio, and even Horatio Gates thinks he's going to be running this meeting, and it's all going to be about, are we going to rise up and demand our pay or revolt? Washington walks in with a very carefully prepared speech where he says, this is against everything we're fighting for. This is against liberty. This is against republicanism. This is not what you're fighting for. Th and he basically talks them down. And he has um, Knox there. And Knox is in on the game ahead of time. And Knox has an alternative resolution ready to go. And he offers it where the troops back Washington and say, we renounce the use of force. We will not have, and think of the rest of the world. How did Caesar gain power? How did Napoleon gain power? Using troops. We are, and all through the revolution, the British propagandists had said, why are you fighting a revolution to get rid of one King George only to get another? Every revolution ends in tyranny by the leader. Washington had heard all those things. Now he stands up against it, he denounces it, and the public relations machine was ready. <laughs> they were ready exactly. to spread the word in every newspaper yeah. what Washington had done at that moment, yeah. that he had looked down a chance to have what the British had said would inevitably happen, a coup. And instead, he said, I am turning this government over to civilian rule. We, are not, we didn't fight a revolution to attack. And it was electrifying to the country. Every newspaper covered it. Yeah. This is what transformed him from first in war to first in peace. And to show how significant it was, I didn't know this till I went there. I hadn't written the, this was after I wrote the, 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 the Return of George Washington book. 50 years to the day after Washington gave this electrifying speech, and he isn't a great speaker. This was a great speech. Um, his 
50 years later, the people who had been there, coupled with the generation that followed it, built there a huge obelisk. The Washington Monument is there. And what they carved on that, what it says, and I'd never known this, I'd never seen anybody write it before I was looking at it, what's carved on it, it says, birthplace of the republic. These people, 50 years later, we think of 1776, we think of the Constitutional Convention. They thought yeah. that when, when Washington stared down this conspiracy, so it had that force in their mind. So yeah. whether or not there was actually gonna be one, how it played out, yeah. it established the civilian rule. Well, I think it, what you're so good at in, in, the, in the book is, is that these set pieces, they're theatrical, and then they're, they become very quickly part of the historical memory that shapes how people are supposed to understand what the revolution meant, um, what the rule of law means in America, what Washington is all about. There's a couple of them. There's, there's that, of course. There, and, and that sets up the stage for the next big you know, uh, uh, theater, which is him you know, returning his commission at the State I House. I put Francis Tavern in between. Francis Tavern, but uh, and yeah. the returning the commission. And then, of course, you know, and the book ends with another big one, which is the inauguration of Washington. And so there's these, there's these set pieces in which Washington is the star of the show. He's the main actor, and people, yeah. and 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 this is a world in which the theater, the Shakespearean world, their, their worldview is shaped by these things. These have meaning to those people in a fundamental way. And and I think you nailed it when you said the main actor, yeah, because. Washington, unlike Jefferson, unlike Adams, was not a great speaker, was not a great writer, yeah. but he loved theater. He was an actor. These were stage. Yeah. And Adams, who is all, there's always a bite to everything Adams says, but he's a very insightful person. And John Adams, when it was all over, and he'd been his vice president, he said that George Washington was the best political actor I have ever seen. He knew a part. He knew how to play it. He wasn't a great speaker like Lincoln. He wasn't a great writer, but he was a great actor. And these were, I think, prepared acting parts where he was playing the Cincinnatius role or whatever role he was choosing, and he was playing it of Shakespearean quality. Yeah. And we don't remember that about Washington. We just see this picture of him on the one dollar bill, yeah. and we sort of think this awkward guy with the bad teeth. But he was a powerful yeah. presence. And it's strange. There's never been a good movie about him because uh, the, the, you know he was such a, a, a performer in his own right. I've got I got a lot more questions. I don't want to walk through the whole book. I want to invite you all to join the conversation. We tried our experiment here. Uh, <clears throat> let's see what we got. Um, did you organize these in any fashion, Stephen McLeod? Okay, good. That's great. I'm going to start. I'm going to start with uh, Ed Ryan. Some of you put your names on these, which is great. I was going to say that it wasn't required, even though it says name. And, and <laughs> you guys follow your rules followers. I like that. That's good. Ed Ryan says, in your view, did Lincoln's actions, uh, suspension of habeas corpus, jailing newspaper editors, freeing slaves only in the Confederacy, et cetera, display a brilliant interpretation of the Constitution or a complete pragmatic disregard of it? That's a very good question. Lincoln. Lincoln. It's a very good question. Now when is the Lincoln the book Lincoln. coming out? When's the Lincoln book coming out? <laughs> I, it's, it's a very good question because it's very tough from a constitutional viewpoint, even though Lincoln was a fine constitutional lawyer. It's very hard from a constitutional viewpoint to justify what Lincoln did. And then you add on, you didn't even ask, you didn't even list Merriman, where literally he disobeyed an order of the Supreme Court, um, which told him to, you know, habeas corpus literally disobeyed it. Um, so there were lots of instances where Lincoln um, did it. But Lincoln believed these were necessary to save the Union. And anything's justified if you believe that it's necessary to save the Union. Mm. But strictly following the Constitution, no, I mean, he didn't. The Constitution isn't a suicide agreement. That's right? what he Who said. said that? Somebody famous said that. Well, virtually, it's close to what um, it's certainly what a suicide pact. It, it's certainly what Lincoln believed, and uh, he did make similar comments when justifying his actions to um, Congress. He virtually said it. He had another wording of it, and I forget what it is. But good question. True point. 
Okay, here's one, and this is uh, anonymous, a name. Uh, did Washington have a life-changing event? What was it? How did it change him, and how did it impact our nation? Hmm. These are great. These are much better than my questions. Electoral college. I, um, <laughs> I don't think Washington had a specific life-changing event, but this is related to this. Washington had a tremendous, I believe, he had a tremendous sense of, of, of purpose and of calling. And he believed that he was called to lead the revolution. Hmm. And he believed that he was saved in battle on particular incidences, including earlier during the French and Indian War to execute that purpose. And sounds so like an egomaniac the way you talk about it. Well, I think he, that he has a particular role to play in world history. I think he did. He yeah. Washington if you look back as early as when he was almost young, he said I, what do you want in life? He, mm. he he wanted fame. And he doesn't mean fame like the Kardashians. He meant fame yeah. like he would make a difference. He would leave a legacy. And I think he was a child in the Enlightenment. I think he believed Keeping in, up with the Washingtons would be a good in one. these ideas of, of popular rule and of individual rights. And he thought the world was changing and America could be. A, he had a great sense of American purpose and American destiny and that America is a, uh, a special place and we are going to be the uh, a shining city on the hill. He didn't word it that way. but for Europe and they're going to follow and that he had a role in leading that transition mm. and then he gets after the revolution's over and he comes back here he gets very depressed in his letters oh woe mm. is me um, there's no point left I'm going to die soon um, and then yeah. later on he gets another and he doesn't really want to get involved with World Trade and he really thinks his purpose is over but when he sees it all collapsing and when he gets a vision of a new government thanks to advice he receives from John Jay and Henry Knox primarily, but also Madison, he comes back. Now his sense of purpose is the Constitution, is the new government, mm. because I'm going to institutionalize what I began, and I'll be, as Knox said, twice the father of your country. Mm. And I do think, especially he didn't have any children to pass things on, I think he had that sense of purpose, that sense of destiny. He believed in um, divine providence, and that was part of the divine providence, and I think he was he thinks he was saved for that purpose. So, so you could say any one of those incidents were a little bit of the way, a little bit of a, but they weren't quite like one dramatic event. But it does give him that that sense. That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I like it. I'm going to ask it of other people because I think uh, we this might get some different different answers. Now here's John Allen. You uh, keep you, saying I'm wrong. You meant, well, I'm saying I, I would answer it maybe. I, I mean, I don't know what I would say. I mean, I might say something today. I might say something different tomorrow. I think it's a, it's a big life, Washington. You could run for president. Well, that's right. Okay, so uh, John Allen, <coughs> you, you mentioned Madison at the end there. John Allison, uh, Allen asks another very difficult question that many scholars will, will, will argue over. I think I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Madison frequently visited Washington try to convince him to participate in the convention, work on the Constitutional Convention, the reforms. Uh, then he became an anti-federalist, or we might say a Jeffersonian Republican. Why did Madison have this change of heart, and how did Washington react? It is a good question. Um, Madison was always very, I believe that Madison was, all, was Madison was primarily a, I, I, I sort of describe him as a, as a policy wonk or a nerd. Um, he wasn't, he, he was great at. So he was Washington's nerdy friend for a while? For a while, yeah. and then Jefferson. Yeah. Right. He was great at executing things. He wasn't great, that was his great strength. He was great at, at, at figuring out how to execute it, like the Karl Rove to the George W. Bush movie. Mm -hmm. And he was Washington's, cons he was definitely described by some as Washington's prime minister. Great politicians have to have a nerd herd that follows them around, basically. When Washington first becomes president, yeah. that role is played by Madison. Mm. And Madison truly believed the true share by the Roman society in the new government. And he was deeply, 
believed in a national market economy, and he believed that the government should have the power to tax, and you can watch him for years. Um, from Congress, and when he's leading up to the Constitutional Convention, a stronger national government. Well, Jefferson, who he was also close to, was not here then. Jefferson was, by most of this time, was over in France, and he was writing back and forth. And he was working more closely with Washington, who deeply believed in the, the idea of, of a stronger national government, that part of Madison. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was dealing with Hamilton. They were together at the Annapolis Convention when they come up with the idea of having the Constitutional and Hamilton believed this even stronger. So he was working with that group and he was sort of executing. Then Jefferson comes, and he knew Jefferson didn't feel as strongly these ways. Then Jefferson comes back and Madison begins to gravitate to Jefferson's magnetism because he was a very charismatic individual. Madison was not a charismatic individual. And also at that same time. And they'd been friends before Madison and Washington. Very close friends. Were very close, close friends. Um, but Madison works under a person more likely. Then I think Madison is hurt because remember Matt, Washington first wants to have as his treasury secretary Robert Morris who'd been behind all this stuff before of the bank and mm. that centralizing and Robert Morris won't do it. He's caught in economic problems of his own that lead to his bankruptcy and going to debtor's prison and he's, he, he, and he's a senator and, he, and so Hamilton gets the job. And Hamilton has this very magnetic, powerful personality. He's brilliant. And, and he usurps uh, Madison's role. And he becomes basically the prime minister mm. that wa that for Washington. And Madison was in the Congress, of course. He was a member of the House of Representatives. And so that, in one sense, yeah. pushes him away yeah. from Washington. Yeah. But you also have the... the um, the magnetism of Jefferson, and Jefferson's growing concerns because he's looking at what Hamilton does. And remember, Hamilton at the Constitutional Convention famously wants to abolish the states altogether, which is, of course, what happens in France. They get rid of all the old provinces and make districts, and that's what Hamilton wants. Hamilton's totally against the states, and that all seems more extreme than Madison ever really wanted, or Washington, I believe, ever really wanted. And so, also, you have the slavery issue floating around in there, mm -hmm. is there's a fear that, because Hamilton is against slavery, there's a fear that if you really do get rid of the states, there won't be a bulwark to protect slavery in those states that want to have it. And Madison was always much more committed to slavery than either Jefferson or, Jefferson becomes more committed toward the end of his life. Yeah. But Hamilton was, all, I mean, Madison was always a supporter of slavery. Washington, we all know the story of Washington, ends up freeing the slaves on the, he, he's, he's, tor he's, he's torn because he has people like um, um, uh, Lafayette pleading with him to, to make a statement on slavery. So Washington's a little bit of torn. It's complicated. You're going to have a whole conference on it. Jefferson's complicated. Yeah. He's the American Sphinx on this issue. <laughs> yeah. But Madison's never complicated on this issue. And so then you throw in the protection of slavery in the states. All these steps, I think, being pushed away from Washington, being mm -hmm. usurped by Hamilton, being drawn by Jefferson and begin yeah. a lot of support by Jefferson, it weans him over. And he's more interested in executing. Whenever he's on a side, he's the best guy to figure out how to succeed, how to do it, how to pull it off. And so he's working with the Constitution and getting it and nationalism with Washington. And he's critical with coming up with ideas that execute Washington's basic ideas and other nationalists. But now he becomes critical in executing a more states' right of state. Now, Jefferson was never truly an anti-federalist. He was a little bit, he was, he was a compromise between the two. But ha Madison ends up becoming it. But then when poor Madison ends up having to be president, <laughs> then he's really torn because and that's why he's not a very good president, because he doesn't want to do as mm. president, because he doesn't have anybody he's under. When you don't know what to do as president, you start a war. Everybody you start a war. That. Yeah. Which is what Madison war. did. You start a war. It, it, it's a fascinating story, the great Madison question. Washington it's thing. It's a great question. You could attack it from so many different angles. You know, fundamentally, the, the, that one of the issues, of course, is Madison is a, a congressman representing a constituency. Washington true. represents the whole nation. That's true. Too. Secretary Treasury represents the whole nation. There's, true. you know, there's things that are uh, that that are pulling him into the Virginia orbit, 
um, but clearly, it, but it's a fascinating story. That one should be added too, because yeah. you could do a whole. That would be a wonderful study to follow that. And I yeah. and I'm I'm not an expert in it. I'm giving you my idea. There's a great book. Uh, God, what is the guy's name? Um, it's called Founding Friendship. Oh, Stuart Leibinger, uh, on Madison and, and Washington. On Madison, Washington, right? It, and uh, I, I like Stuart very much. It's a it's a very good book. Um, but I do think at the end, it, it's uh, you're still lingering with this sort of question, sort of why did they, you know, break? How did it break down? Because I think you can, you know, in some cases you can't read people's hearts. You know. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, there's so many great ones here. If I don't, if I don't list yours, don't take it personally. I mean, there's 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 some that want you to comment on Washington's opinion on the current presidential race, which we'll 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 we'll, we'll hold off we'll hold off on that one. Uh, let's try this one. Frank Dillo, talk about GW's views on private property. He was always a property owner mm -hmm. here in, Indo in Ohio, in, in the West. Uh, uh, many property titles are not uh, known and ignored. Um, and, to, you know, and, and as you show in your work, and I think you have re reestablished this theme very strongly amongst people who are in the Washington world uh, of Washington's interest in property in the West and how it shapes his whole national vision. Washington deeply believed in private property and that's why he found what was happening in Rhode Island so troubling if you look at what pushed him to he had wanted a stronger national union because he think, thought the central government needed the power to tax. He thought that America would be stronger with a national market economy like the European Union. Uh, he deeply believed that uh, because he wanted to sell his goods everywhere. So those were things, and we needed a unified military. Those three things will come out of, come out while he's still a general and in his circular letter to the states. Mm. But then what gets added, which I don't think he was thinking about before, but what gets added is this private property element. He always deeply believed in private property he thought that was one of the reasons we went to war was to protect that England had taken by the intolerable acts that were adopted for Massachusetts after the Boston Tea Party, they took away private property rights in Massachusetts and therefore he's afraid they're gonna take it away in other places. He also, the Somerset decision on slavery in England, that is if you took a slave to England they'd suddenly become free, also cha that was 1773, also challenged private property. So he was concerned with private property and the possibility of the king taking away private property from the very beginning. But then, after the revolution, the printing of paper money, this, and, and he's very close to Madison now, because it's a popular last, and this, Madison, was appalled. <coughs> Madison, what Madison would write about <coughs> printing of paper money, and it was worse in Rhode Island and Georgia were the two worst, but it was, looked like it was gonna follow elsewhere. And the problem with printing of paper money and laws requiring better creditors to take this money is you have suddenly abolished private property because if R Rhode Island can just print all the paper money at once and creditors have to take it for payment, even if they're not there, you can just leave it at their house or leave it in a post office box and you're, you're, it's over, your, your debt is gone, well then your, your private pro you, you know, what's, you, you've taken away private property. It's immoral, and that, right? I mean, and he thought it was immoral. And yeah. uh, Madison uh, was just appalled by this. And he went to Washington. And he, he, he stayed here a lot. And he would talk about it. And he got Washington almost as excited as Madison on this issue. So that became another reason. And that's why the Constitution, it doesn't, it's mostly a procedural document, the original Constitution has very few substantive things in it. It's mostly how you set up the Senate, how you elect the president. But it's got a few, and one is no state can print paper money. That's one in there. And no state can abridge contracts. Yeah. Those are in there. And those are to protect private property, and those come directly from Washington and Madison. So he cared deeply because he thought private property was a fundamental individual liberty. You see it as a sense of liberty. We have a right to private property. And of course, we can feel that in a way you can't in England. Because in England, you know, you had whatever your parents had. If your parent was a lord, you're going to be a lord. And if your parents uh, 
uh, candle maker, you're going to be a candle maker. And if your parents are serf, you're going to be a serf. In America, everyone could go to the frontier, and Washington would write about this. There are several beautiful passages by Washington by, write about this, but Franklin would write about it, others would write about it too. Everyone can go off to the frontier and become a landowner and build an estate. And that possibility of doing that opened up property to more people based more on merit and more on opportunity. So the fact that you have it, property becomes fundamental to their notion of liberty, and, theref and therefore, this, this notion, the, by the time he goes to the Constitutional Convention, the protection of property would be almost at the same level, or maybe at the same level, as the national market economy and the power to tax. And in the way you expressed it there, it doesn't leave a lot of hope for Native American uh, property. Uh, no. And we see Washington as president. Um, one of his great prom he makes he makes three basic promises during the run-up to the campaign. And one is um, expansion westward. He, 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 economic prosperity, that's the national market economy, he promises. But he also promised, this, if we have this government, his arguments for ratification and then for his presidency um, is prosperity at home, peace abroad, the neutrality, you see that in the Neutrality Act, I don't want to get entangled with foreign countries because we just went in a war. So peace abroad, prosperity at home, and expansion westward because that's our future, which means you've got to push the Native Americans back, which is his doctrine of progressive settlement where you'd, you'd open it, you'd take over a territory, you'd make a new state, you'd take over a new territory. You can see it in Ohio and in Indiana and in Illinois. Actually, his original plan had Ohio about half the size that it is, but he's going to move back. And that's why one of his major acts as president, he sends three major armies into Ohio. Mm. The first two are wiped out. One of them is the gr more Americans killed in battle than, you know, we'd ever had before. He presided over one of the greatest disasters in American military history after the Constitution was, was created in his, in his presidency. And that was the first, first Native American battle. And then he finally... It's a battle with no name. Uh, uh, Colin Calloway is right here in the audience, wrote a book about it. And then, then you get the, finally the third one when he sends, um, um, uh, when he sends um, uh, Sinclair, uh, uh, Matt Anthony Wayne out. Uh, one of his great generals, yeah. and then he finally wins. But it takes the th it takes three armies. You know, Saint Anthony Wayne would have rhymed better. <laughs> um, I th yeah. <laughs> Mad Anthony Wayne. I guess the other joke would be Happy Anthony from. Wayne, <laughs> uh, Sad Anthony Wayne. But it was yeah. it was Anthony Wayne because the first the failure was Sinclair, yeah. right? Yes, that was the one that was exactly and and there's uh, other people the as well. We have the like, expert. Why am I talking? The expert will have his time to shine. It is not his night. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, here's a good one. Phil Smucker, uh, who's also writing a study on George Washington Sportsman right now, which is a really necessary and needed uh, oh, that's great. Uh, addition to great. the uh, founding sportsman. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Phil great wants topic. to know, <coughs> do you topic. think George Washington's views on individual rights changed at the end of his life, influencing his views on, for instance, slavery? Uh, did he decide all Americans were essentially born free? And maybe I, I would add a codicil to this question. I mean, how does the, if you think about Washington's interest in individual liberty versus a, a, an evolving notion of that, a question of you know, popular democracy and, and what role that plays in American liberty? You know, I don't have, you say I had views on everything. I don't have strong views on that. I don't think <laughs> that they probably. I said you had views on everything, yes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see, I don't, <laughs> I, I see Washington, I, I see Washington having his um, enlightenment Republican vision. Mm. And I don't necessarily see it changing a whole lot. Mm. I don't. I well, he dies before it's going to change. I mean, the 19th right. century, all this is going to change. And he right. doesn't want to live in the 19th century, so he just it dies. Barely. Right. Barely. Right. In December <laughs> of 1879. Right. I've, I've got to get something wrong with my throat yeah. and uh, hope nobody gives me a tracheotomy yeah. and saves my life. Um, the, um, yeah. I don't think, I, I think he remains a, a, with the old vision of he believes in he believes in people like Benjamin Franklin, 
that you could rise up from you know, originally from, from, from nothing and uh, from being a uh, uh, indentured servant uh, to, for, to his brother to being very rich and very powerful and very successful. So he believed in that meritocracy. He himself wasn't, uh, wasn't quite destined to be what he became, and he was hardworking. And he, so he believes in opportunity, and he wants to have opportunity for common people. But how that actually translates, he obviously has, he frees his slaves on his deathbed. He does, he does change, but I think those were always there. I think he was always mm. conflicted. Once he thought about slavery, which didn't really happen until during the revolution, while he was off in the revolution, he doesn't really change. Now, think about that. Also during the revolution, he stopped going to church. He'd been to church. He'd been an elder before. He comes back and he resigns as an elder and never takes communion again. So he does change on certain things, mm. but he changes within these these mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's faced with the conundrums. I think you've, you, you said it right, but I think he had a very, for his day and age, he had a very progressive, if you want to call it, he had a very enlightened, that'd be a better phrase, enlightened view. And he, he that basically continued mm -hmm within a within limited parameters. Well, let's uh, wrap it up with a question about what's next for you. And what are you, uh, what's the next book? What's the next big study that you're working on? Are you leaving the founding era behind to add to the growing mound of Lincoln books? Or are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm not going back to the Lincoln books. Uh, I'm not going to the Lincoln books. I've never written about Lincoln. Good. Well, I've written law review articles. And, but um, I do have, as you pointed out at the beginning, sort of multiple focuses. Mm. And you're a man of many I parts. I will be back. I will, will definitely continue to write, continue to work on things in the founding era. But my, I do have a, a book that had been sort of floating around for a long time, coming out with Yale, Yale University Press next year, that's on science and religion mm. right back there. And I have a book that's in process that is more like my, I have one called Empire of Ice, which mm. is also a, about Shackleton. Uh, with Shackleton Scott and the Heroic Age of Antarctic Exploration. It's more like that. It's more complicated. It brings in much more focuses, but looking at, looking at the 19, basically 1900 period, 19, it brings in a lot of Teddy Roosevelt, brings in a lot of, of this, this exploring drive, yeah. this conquest drive, climb the highest mountains, go to the North Pole, go to the South Pole, mm. brings in Terry, brings in Cook, bring, as I say, Teddy Roosevelt brings in a whole variety of uh, Churchill, that whole mindset that was working then. Mm. So that moves me back. So you can, yeah. that's basically in the same era the progressive in my era. work. Yeah. The progressive era. Yeah. So I had that, 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 that load, in, that focus in the progressive era where then you suddenly bring in science. But of course with Jefferson and with Franklin, and with Washington, you're bringing in science too, but it was yeah. Enlightenment science versus in science we get this uh, uh, early uh, 1900s where suddenly you've got Darwinian thinking and the survival of the fittest and going out and conquering yeah. the world. So I'm, I'll move back and forth. That's fascinating. I really look forward to seeing that. I think there's a lot of interesting continuities or shades uh, of the world we live in today and that world from 1890 to... 19, you know, 12. It's, uh, I mean, you look at the presidential elections back then, they were crazy then, too. I mean, uh, you know, William Randolph Hearst had all the delegates at the Democratic National Convention. You know, he's kind of a, a gunslinging New Yorker celebrity type. I mean, it's some interesting parallels in that, in that world. So I'm really, I'll be really interested to, to read that. And, and uh, I know everybody else out here will be. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Let's give him a big Thank round of applause. Thank you. And uh, we're going to ask Ed to spend some time signing books. I uh, hope you get it. This is the official launch. So uh, the, the George Washington Nationalist book is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for